will begin and I will extend a very warm welcome to all of you. If this is your first time joining, <laughs> a warm welcome. And to all of you who have been joining these sessions for the duration, it's nice to see you again. My name's Al First and I'm going to be your chairperson for this session. And I'm going to hand over now to the president of the Spiritist National Union, Minister David Bruton, who will introduce today's subject and his panel, David. Thank you, Alf. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Audience with the President. This week, we are actually revisiting a subject that we last covered on the 28th of December, 2020. The subject, of course, as many of you will be aware, was reincarnation. And I suppose it makes a great deal of sense to come back to it, you know, so to speak. Uh, there we go. The jokes get better as we go forward. Uh, tonight, uh, I would like to take our discussion on from where we got to before. Um, and for my guests and panel this evening, uh, I'd like to welcome back uh, Charles Colston, who was on our panel last time. Welcome, Charles. Thank you for uh, joining us again and agreeing to uh, to come and uh, step into the audience with the president uh, firing line, if you like. Uh, Charles, believe it or not, came into spiritualism back in 1959. Uh, and as a fifth form uh, at school, he read Arthur Finley's Rock of Truth and Carl Wickland's 30 Years Amongst the Dead. He graduated from Durham University uh, with a degree in the classics, uh, and in 1966 took up a teaching post in Loughborough Grammar School. He very soon became president of Loughborough Spiritualist Church, and a few years later joined the Spiritualist National Union. He left teaching to become its general secretary in 1980, and retired from that position in 2015 having been the longest serving general secretary the union has been honored to have. Uh, Charles continues his work for the union. Um, he's currently a member of the General Purposes Committee, and that's the committee, if you're not aware, that formulates all the rules, bylaws, uh, memorandum and associate of association. So basically, if you hate the rules, Charles is one of the people you've got to blame. So, <laughs> Welcome very much for, and thank you for joining us again. Thank you. Uh, our next panel member is a gentleman that I have to admit, I think he's been one of a few number of consistent people on audience with the president since we began back in last March. I don't know whether he's missed a week. Um, I, I certainly haven't had any notes off his mom to excuse him, but um, he's, he's been with us most weeks. And I speak, of course, of Minister Brian Gledhill. Brian first entered a spiritualist church back in 1974 in Harrogate. In 1976, he left Harrogate and moved to Scarborough, uh, where he joined uh, the, at Queen Street, Queen Street, Scarborough the Spiritualist Church there. In 1980, this will be familiar to many of us, he became the president of Scarborough Church when the committee walked out. Uh, don't we know the feeling, Brian? We really do. Um, he's uh, been a, a speaker and demonstrator since 1975 and has also developed a keen interest in reincarnation which is one of the reasons I've invited him to join us tonight. Um, he thought it was provable and he has gone on to study hypnosis in order to get the necessary tools to begin to formulate that body of evidence that has uh, helped him move forward in his studies. So I'm sure Brian brings a slightly different dimension to our guests at our previous evening and certainly has had a lot of experience talking to him before we started um, with hypnotherapy and regression. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that we can explore some of that tonight. Also, many of you will know Brian is very well known as chairman of the Lyceum Union, an organization that predates the Spiritualist National Union 
and I know Brian, supported by his wife Mary, is a loyal member of the SNU and has done an incredible amount of work over many years. Brian, we welcome you and thank you for joining us. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure. So what I would like to do, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is begin our discussion this evening. Um, and I'm going to invite Charles to start. Um, and watching back the December um, edition yesterday, uh, Charles gave a wonderful description of um, where he felt spiritualism was in its approach to reincarnation. So for the benefit of the people that didn't see the last episode, um, I, I, I'd like to ask you, Charles, if you would start. Um, last time you talked about uh, Hinduism's approach to reincarnation and Buddhism, Buddhism's approach. But I'd like you this time perhaps just to concentrate on where you feel spiritualism and spiritualists come from in regards to reincarnation. Yes, last time I was concerned that if we were going to talk about spiritualism, then we ought to be sure that we all have the same concept in mind and that we weren't talking about different kinds like Buddhist uh, reincarnation, uh, Hindu, and so on. Um, so I won't be repeating myself on that score. It's very difficult to talk about uh, a spiritualist notion of reincarnation. I have a fair idea in my mind of what I believe uh, the majority of guides that have taught these things over the last hundred years have a fairly clear concept in my mind of what they regard as reincarnation. And I did uh, say something about this last time, and if I can briefly paraphrase that, and I can't do better than really point to Silver Birch, who gave what I regard as the definitive concept of spiritualism, as most spiritualist teachers and guides would express it. He asked us to consider that each and every incarnation on earth has a higher self, a higher self which remains in its due place in spirit. It is not part of what comes down to the, the, the plane of physical matter. And what he said was that the individual personality which incarnates on earth is really a very small part of the, the total individuality to which that spirit belongs. He used the concept of a diamond, a diamond with many facets. And the, in the concept that he put forward, he said the personality which incarnates into matter is but one facet of that diamond. He, he said, and I quote here, what you express on earth is but an infinitesimal fraction of the individuality to, wh uh, to which you belong. And some of you will know of the, the teacher and spirit guide, White Feather. In, in many ways, he, he operates this day in the West Midlands, and I've been privileged to attend one of his question and answer sessions. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm amazed at how much he reminds me of Silver Birch in the teachings he comes out with. It's, he, he is almost a natural successor to Silver Birch in the way he speaks, the concepts he puts forward and so on. So having said what Silver Birch said, I would like to just quickly give you an idea of how White Feather continued that concept. White Feather said, it is never the totality of the self which comes into incarnation because the lesser cannot contain the greater. The self that incarnates is only a facet of the diamond that comes into a physical incarnation at any time. We are never disconnected from our higher selves. It is always there. 
but we we are not very mindful or conscious of it because it doesn't have the same conscious expression as the facet which is manifesting as you and I in this body of matter. But although it is never the totality of the self which comes into the body of matter, everything we accumulate to the gifts we have earned uh, through our past lives, we carry that into our future experiences. So everything we think, say and do, hopefully adds to the luster of that particular facet of the diamond. And sadly, in some cases, it tarnishes that, the luster of that facet. But it's important to stress that those gifts and experiences which that facet uh, goes through, undergoes in its incarnation, it takes back with it to the higher self. And other portions of the consciousness of the higher self can take from that. So we are not living in isolation as a single facet of the diamond. White Feather said, when that facet of the diamond links with the higher self, when it passes back into spirit, it cannot exclude itself from what has gone before. And it will add to the experiences and totality of the consciousness of the higher self. And that, I think, is one explanation as to why uh, but it's not the only one, the one explanation as to why through hypnotic regression we sometimes get uh, an experience of a previous life. For my money, hypnotic regression is a very valuable source of evidence. I wouldn't like to say proof because I don't think yeah. Silver Bird said himself, you will never prove uh, re uh, reincarnation because you can you can say that everything is due to con spirit control and therefore absolute proof is, un is impossible. But for my money, the balance of probabilities is that the hypnotic regression provides a valuable source of evidence. But because the, the, the facet of that diamond takes back its experiences and shares them with the remaining consciousness of the higher self, I would just mention as a possibility that sometimes, but I only stress sometimes, that uh, the hypnotic regressionist may be enabling that person not in, to tap into a previous life, but is tapping into memories which were shared by other portions of that higher self. Uh, in, in other incarnations from the same higher self. So I only mention that to, uh, to uh, draw a note of caution. Anyway, I think I've said enough, David, just to set the picture there of... <clears throat> Thank you, Charles, that, that, that was uh, interesting. Um, Charles, just before I go to Brian, and I'd like to go to Brian and talk about hypnotic regression, which is something he's got had quite a lot of experience about. Um, just to cl clarify something in my own mind, um, you talk about this diamond and the concept of the majority of the, of the diamond remaining in spirit and just a small part coming here to the physical. Is, is that a similar concept to group soul or something like that? Or is that a totally different concept? Well, now that's very interesting because Silver Birch uh, was asked this question about where the group soul comes into it. And uh, I've got a quote here, uh, which if I can find it, 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 just bear with me, because I think this is very relevant. Yes. Uh, the person who was asking him questions referred to a statement by Frederick Myers, who said uh, that uh, group souls uh, 
uh, in a sense, were equivalent to the, the fragments of, of soul consciousness which come from the higher self. And Silver Birch said, yes, it's really the same thing, except the group soul is not a grouping of different souls. It is a union of the different portions of consciousness returning to complete the whole. Now, I'm not, I've got to be honest, I'm not sure what to make of that. I've always grown up with the idea that uh, the group soul consists of a family of souls, which for one reason or another have shared outlook, experiences and so on, and that they often meet and decide to reincarnate uh, w with other members of the same family in a particular incarnation. Silver Birch seems to be saying that the group soul isn't actually a grouping of different souls. He seems to be saying it's, it's the different portions of consciousness of a single higher self uh, returning to complete the whole. I think it muddies the waters slightly. I, 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 but that's all I can say. That um, I am genuinely unsure whether Silver Birch was saying that group souls uh, are not really what we think because e everything else I've read on that subject seems to indicate that each member of a group soul is a soul and the higher self in its own right. So I only mention that as a possibility and something that it's worth bringing up in case you, you've you not heard that sort of theory before, but i give you for, for what it's worth. Mm. That's brilliant. So Brian, can I come to you now? Um, yeah. You've studied um, hypnosis and hypnotherapy, and uh, I understand also you've actually practiced regression. So perhaps for anyone in our audience, me included, that's never been regressed, can you talk to us a little about the process, the theory, uh, the reach of the regression, um, whether it is always reaching out to uh, other lives or whether there are levels within the regression that perhaps uh, give us access to other states of our own individual consciousness. I think all that you said, David, would apply in different parts. Um, first and foremost, if someone comes wanting to be regressed hypnotically, it's because they can't remember uh, a past existence or a, a past experience some people can they don't need hypnosis they can remember things or things in their life uh, point to various incidents and, and i can only use myself uh, as an example um i don't really care for horses nothing against them they're very very nice creatures upon god's earth but i'm a little bit afraid of them um same as back to when I was about four and the local rag and bone man came round with his horse and I went to give it a piece of bread and the piece of bread and my finger went into its mouth and it hurt so I don't like horses I, I'm not comfortable near them now that's a memory it's a memory in my single lifetime but eventually uh, having studied regression and gone into it a little bit and then studied the philosophy of spiritualism and started to meditate, I began to see images during the meditation. Those images were of horses' hooves coming down on my head. So somewhere in, in my past, I have memories of either being ridden down or run over by a horse, and that would linger within my mind. During uh, the time that I've spent studying regression and reincarnation and the different kinds of reincarnation, uh, I would have to say right from the outset that I agree with everything Charles has just said. The principle that I look at is that the self is a many faceted being, that certain aspects of the personality come to earth uh, in an incarnation and the rest remains in the spirit world and they're all reunited at the point we call death or the passing um, 
and then other parts may come down into another incarnation. It's a very complicated thing. And the best answer I once had from spirit, I say once because they don't answer it very often. Um, the best answer I had was that um, one day when things are better understood, we would realize that there are sometimes necessary actions which need to bring about something that we might call reincarnation. They're very, very loath to commit themselves into calling it reincarnation because to them it's not. It's just a part of someone, a part of a being, which is not, like, not, a, not a conglomerate, but like a diamond. Charles used a very good analogy and the facets on the diamond. And in particular, the light that shed by the facets on that diamond. And those lights are what we would call the spirit, the soul that comes down onto the earth plane. When we look at the necessary part of hypnotic regression, we use it because, as I've said, we can't remember so far back. There are techniques you can use which are very, very similar to hypnosis, but they're not. Um, hypnosis is used because it's simple. It's quite easy to train someone in, in hypnosis. Uh, it's not a very complicated thing, um, but it's a matter of relaxing someone, being able to put someone in a nice, calm, relaxed state and speak to their inner self. And that doesn't matter whether you're going to give them therapy, if you're going to stop them smoking, or whether you're going to do a regression. It doesn't matter at all. It's the same state. It's a very light state. It's not somnambulistic. Like our hypnotic, like our uh, trance states, it's very light because if you put someone into a, a somnambulistic state, then they aren't going to be able to answer you. They won't remember what you've been talking about when you bring them back. So it's a very light state. And in that light state, being very, very careful not to suggest things to them, you can talk them, uh, talk to them and Ask them to remember or recall various things. Ask them what they can see or feel or hear or understand what's happening. And usually, not always, but usually, you get an answer. It might not be the answer you want. It might be a, a, a very vague answer which needs clarification. I hypnotised the gentleman who was the leader of the Jewish community in the area of London where the Jewish golf club is. And in public, in, in presence of all his, his fellows, I hypnotised him and asked him where he was and he said he was in a field. And I said, what was in the field? Were they turnips or corn? And he looked at me as though I was something from another planet and said, it's a battlefield. And he was dead bad. It was absolutely deadpan. He, he just couldn't understand why he didn't know where he was. Uh, so it's that sort of answer yet. And, and true regression takes a long, long time to build, a long, long time to understand, and a long, long time to research. It's not something that we do uh, at each over in course of an hour. That's a demonstration of what you can do. But a true regression can take weeks, months, or even years. Um, and when we get a subject that we can take through regression over a period of time, uh, the principles of the argument that Charles put forward actually manifest themselves. Um, a friend of mine uh, submitted himself for examination uh, over a period of about three years and regularly, once or twice a week, we went through the process of examining what he could feel, describe, and understand. He was asked on many, many occasions to go back to specific years, to tell us what he was experiencing on such and such a day. And he never, ever got it wrong. He never, ever slipped up. Um, it didn't matter what we did. 
he talked about a number of different existences, none of which I could make a head and tail of. It was just, I was writing down the notes. And, um, but then one day he came and he said, I've been to this town. And if you remember, we talked about going to a town and going to the cemetery and there were various things that, that had been mentioned. He said, I found the cemetery. I found the house where I used to live. And I found the school that I went to. I spoke to the headmaster and there was a boy with the same name that I gave at the school at the time that I said it was there. Now, I'm a spiritualist and I believe that life's eternal. But I have to accept the principle that there are many facets to our life, not just one. And when we look at the evidence that's provided, we have to realize that when we look at hypnosis as a tool, we have to be careful how we use that tool. And when we get the information, we have to check it because it's no good just accepting anything and everything. Um, I think I might have answered your question, David. I don't want to ramble on about uh, something and nothing, but... Uh... I know you said very well indeed, Brian. Just, I, w I want to just clarify a point which you did touch on. So you can actually take uh, a candidate back through regression to a particular period. Yes. You can repeat that process time and time again. So you are almost building up like a, a body of knowledge from each sitting That's that, right. that creates the evidence that you then take away and research. That, right. that is truly fascinating. That's yeah. Um, the, the, you have to first of all know that something happened in that time. Yes. Um, Perhaps an example would be um, a, a lady I hypnotised uh, and she told me that she got married and she'd gone to live in Italy and she was there with her husband on a, a kind of a honeymoon. Um, now, we were in the, the period in the 17th century, 17th, 18th century, and it was a very romantic time and the dresses were lovely and the clothes were nice and... Italy was wonderful. This lady read a tremendous amount of historical literature. So I was beginning to doubt that this was the true regression. It was a memory from her own mind. Until she said, all the men have gone. And I stopped and said, what do you mean? All the men have gone. And she said, all the men from the village have gone. And she mentioned uh, another village name in the middle of Italy. And I said, why have they, why have they gone there? Why, why would they go and leave you all then? Or they've gone to see this man who's coming up through Italy and is going to cause a lot of trouble. And I thought, oh, right. I wrote it down. And uh, after the session, I started to research, started to look where this village was. It actually was a village. And where the other village, the second village mentioned was, there was a second village. At the time she'd given me, perhaps give or take a year, a man called Napoleon Bonaparte was coming up through Italy toward France, making his way slowly up the country, causing all sorts of trouble as he went, and leading lots and lots of people. All the men folk wanted to go with him, but of course the wives wouldn't let him. And I, I stopped dead in my tracks because she didn't know that. She hadn't a clue what she'd said. She didn't even remember saying that particular sentence. But she had, had recorded it. So I have to believe that even though we have memories and we are drawn to read certain 
articles of literature, certain types of literature, it might be for a reason. It might be a part of the facets that are in that diamond. Thank you, Brian. That's wonderful. I'm going to ask you one more question and I'm going back to Tom. Um, can any, I'm sure you've been asked this question a thousand times, but I'm going to ask it. Can anybody be regressed? No. <laughs> That's the simple answer. Okay. The more complex answer is yes, they can. Give them time. Um, if people don't want to be hypnotised, then nothing on earth can make them. Okay. It's not like on the films or the telly where Sven Garley comes round the corner and waves his hand and you've gone. Nothing like that at all. You've got to have um, a permission. You give permission. Uh, you might say you give permission by being there in the first place, but you find that, um, I found, doing demonstrations that quite often the victim, for want of a better term, the person who volunteered their services to be hypnotised would come up onto the stage of the rostrum with the sole intention of ruining the demonstration for everybody. And that's happened quite a few times. And you learn to deal with it. And uh, one chap in particular, I do remember, was a dentist. And he used hypnosis as part of his dentistry as an analgesic. And uh, he didn't want this demonstration to work. So after trying unsuccessfully to hypnotise him, I sent him back to his seat and said to the ladies and gentlemen there, there you are, that proves that I can't hypnotise anybody, you've got to want to do it. And pulled up the next chap, sitting next to him, and took him back uh, with no trouble at all. Within five minutes, he were back in his seat, having had a wonderful experience and seen all sorts of things. Uh, so no, not everybody can be, but everybody who gives the permission can be, given time. Thank you for that, Brian. Can I, can I come back to you? And I'd like to just bring the focus back a little bit about spiritualism. Um, I think we, we, we commented in the last uh, session we did about the, the, the different camps within spiritualism. Uh, the spiritualists who want no part of reincarnation, the spiritualists who um, perhaps are on the fence, the spiritualists who believe ardent, ardently in it, and then, of course, Stephen Upton added a fourth dimension, talking about the one life spiritualists. Um, Charles, um, where do you think the concept of reincarnation leads spiritualist teachings? Where do I think it leads it? Yes. Do you think, do you think it, it helps inform spiritualist oh, teachings or, or not? My personal view is that it does. Uh, because Silver Birch, again, I, I like to go back to Silver Birch. Uh, he, he, one of the questions he was asked was, uh, why do we need to bother with reincarnation? Surely our main uh, thrust of, of our work should be on survival. Uh, and again, I, I wrote a quote out. Um, and, uh, he said, bear with me. He said, it's better to be in the light than in the dark. It's better to have knowledge than ignorance. Better to know the laws than not to know the laws. Survival is not the end. It's only the beginning. For when you understand that you are a, great, a part of the great spirit, and because of that, you pass through the avenue of death unharmed and unchanged, that is not the end of things. That's only the beginning. So... If Silver Birch feels that way, who am I to feel differently? But I, uh, so those of you who were here at the previous session will know that I also said that I am not really sure whether spiritualists ought to officially pronounce upon it. I know that might seem odd for someone who accepts reincarnation of the truth that I believe it is. But I have to seriously consider the impact of the SNU or other spiritualist body embracing reincarnation and teaching it as a fact in all its churches. 
I think the difficulty is, excuse me, <coughs> that we don't know with a cast iron certainty all the ways in which it operates. There are many aspects of it where there isn't complete clarity and therefore I'm slightly chary of supporting a, a pronouncement on reincarnation which would make it sound as if it was very clear cut when it isn't. Um, spiritualists have left it on the fence at least uh, it, as regards public recognition they've left it on the fence and I did say last time, and I'll say it again, it is probably left better on the fence and leave those who really are interested in the philosophy of spiritualism to learn about it for themselves, giving them every opportunity to explore this subject and wherever possible, uh, where you have an opportunity, try to steer them towards a consideration of it. Uh, I wouldn't do that in a normal church service because I don't think really um, a normal spiritualist church service, I don't think is really the forum for coming out with, um, shall I say, topics which involve the higher spiritualism. So having, you know, having said I'm on, the, uh, uh, I'm only on the fence with regards to uh, publishing it as a spiritualist fact uh, by, an, uh, by, you know, an organization like the SNU. Um, there are too many, there are too many uncertainties. Uh, once you start to ask some of the questions, it's very difficult to answer them and to know how, how it really operates. I mean, when you get spirit guides saying that they, uh, there's no such thing as reincarnation, admittedly not many, but when you get some guides teaching from the afterlife that that reincarnation isn't true, you wonder what on earth's going on. Mm. Uh, I mean, obviously, the, the vast majority do teach it. But when you've got people uh, in, in, in the life to come who say it doesn't apply, then you wonder how they got to be spirit guides. Mm. You know, yeah. and that's no, no disrespect to them. Yeah. So the Birch explained it nicely. He said, there are some, even in my uh, plane of being, uh, who simply do not know because they've never encountered it. Mm. I, I, still, I still wonder, though, how on earth can a guide with that elevated status have failed to encounter reincarnation? It's just something I find it very difficult to accept. So there you are, David. Um, Thanks, Charles. Uh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. I'm going to make a comment and then I'm going to open up to our audience and give them the opportunity to ask any questions that they would like. Um, I, I wonder if a part of our uh, attempt to progress our spiritualist thinking, which I think we need to do, and maybe we need to do more than we think, is to build up or perhaps to revisit the concept of the afterlife, um, we seem in our teachings and in our services and in our demonstrations to spend a lot of time providing evidence of individual survival, which is important because that is the foundation upon which spiritualism is built. But maybe from a philosophical viewpoint, we need to take more heed of of life in the next dimension and, and realize that it, it, it perhaps is very complicated and, and from our perspective, our view of that dimension is going to be a limited view. Um, but to me, uh, as somebody that has been involved for a while in spiritualism, uh, I wonder if um, how much time we have developed in the current age um, looking at the world of the spirit, if you like. I don't know. Brian, what's your, what's your views on that? Do you think I'm totally wrong? or No, no not at all. Um, if I said in 1976, um, when I was beginning to be interested in, in reincarnation and where it fitted, 
into uh, the religious aspect of my life, I firmly believed that one day I would prove that reincarnation existed. I am further away from that proof now than I was when I began. Because as you, as you explore the subject, it gets bigger. Yes. It, it grows exponentially. So that the further in you get, the more explanations you get, the less you know. Um, Charles's um, comment uh, about why some, some guides don't understand anything about it, um, some of them uh, that I've spoken with um, in meditation and in various uh, sessions with other mediums uh, have actually out, out and out said, I don't believe in it. I don't want to, I don't want to believe in it. It's not part of who I am. Literally, as though they wanted to close their minds to it. Uh, but others are so open, like Silver Birch, so open about it that we need to understand more fully what this religion is and how it fits into the scheme of things. If you study religion, and I, I know you have, David, and uh, I know Charles has, if you study religions, comparative religions, most of what we believe is contained in the other religions. Most of what they believe, we actually accept. Uh, it, it's not anything outlandish. It's just that we haven't explored it. In 150 years, we haven't looked at it. If we start to look at it now, it might frighten some people. It might worry some people. But I think it's necessary knowledge. I think we need to look properly with a measured eye to see whether we can accept anything like the concept uh, of life being a facet of a major, huge interaction of life, whatever that life may be, the higher self. I think we need to know more about this part that we play in the cosmic whole. Um, that's my money. That, that's, that's what I believe. And, um, I don't discount anything. I accept that there are lots and lots of things that I haven't got a clue about. Um, I think about them. Don't always know what they're talking about. And spirit bring lots of things that I, I have to think about for a long time. But life itself is a conundrum. It's a great puzzle that we need to unravel. Um, we're not going to do that if we have blinkers on our eyes and, and a blindfold. Absolutely, Brian. Absolutely. I think, I think as spiritualists, we need to be prepared to push the boundaries of our understanding out right. if we wish. Obviously, not everybody will want to do that. They are quite happy and satisfied to have the evidence that the loved ones exist and can communicate, but um, surely to, 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 to find that higher awareness is something that we should be also working towards in some aspect of our movement. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm now at this point going to invite people to come into our conversation. Um, please, I'm, I'm sure the ground we've covered in the last 45 minutes has given you plenty of uh, uh, opportunity to ask questions, uh, to share your views and your ideas, um, and let's try and get through as many as we can. Um, I'm going to uh, keep the, um, this to be very much an open session. Um, normally, I would hand over to, to Alv, but I'm going to bring Alv in as well, because then he can bring people in from the chat room. And uh, is there anybody that's got any questions, any points? Please raise your hand and uh, we'll, we'll try and get to them. Uh, and straight away, oh, that's wonderful. We've got uh, people that want to come in. We've got uh, Carol in, and then I'm going to bring Paul Challenger in as well, who's asked in the chat room. So, uh, Carol in. Would you like to uh, switch on your microphone? There you go. Good evening, Carolyn. You're muted at the moment, so if you can unmute yourself. I'm trying to unmute. Yes, you are. You okay. Can you hear me now? You've succeeded. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much to the two gentlemen. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed the, uh, the your, your talk and explanations. I just wanted to say that I had an experience of having uh, regression as part of an experiment in America. 
and I was asked specifically to come up with three issues in my life. Um, and so one of them was my persistent weight, one of them was, was my restlessness and my aloneness. And uh, I came up with these things uh, and, and I thought, you know, this is just my imagination. But then the lady said, well, what is your imagination? So I basically came up as an American, for my restlessness, I came up as an American Indian moving the tribe and then the volcano uh, basically came down and, and, and killed us all. So I had tremendous guilt. Um, and, uh, and the other two I don't need to go into, but it was interesting what happened. The reason she was using the, re the, the um, past life regression was to see what impact from my prior lives was with me now in my current life. It wasn't so much in exploring what happened in great detail, although we, we could have done, but she would take me to the, a particular life, planted me basically in the middle of that life. Um, and if it was uncomfortable, like when she planted me in with the American Indian life, um, my, I immediately felt my feet were burning. So she put me back a bit further back uh, and it, the, the feet burning was in fact the lava um, coming down I was burning. So that was, that was that. And then the other example I've had is I met a gentleman in this country and he said to me, I know you. And I said, well, yes, you know, we've just met. He said, no. He said, I knew you in World War II. Um, and he said, you were taken by the Germans. He said, I lost track of you. He said, but I was informed later that you had died. He was uh, in the resistance. He was convinced. And he worked out all the times. He told me which village I'd come from. And I did go to that village. And I did have some weird feelings. But I wasn't sure if it was really based on a past life or just... Or, or, or to suggestion. But I, I, I think it's a good thing to get, get involved with and, and look at if it pertains to this life. But I think there's a tendency too much to keep looking back. It's like, you know, we, I, I, I don't mean any disrespect, but we look a lot at the past pioneers. And I think your suggestion of, of looking more in what's going on in spirit as well, you know, and now, uh, I think that's wonderful because I think it's it's we need this, you know, we need to have some depth of knowledge. I mean, we're living on this planet. We should know what goes on and we should also know what goes on after we die. And it's wonderful that we can get messages for our, from our relatives, but uh, surely we should have a bigger picture. So thank you so much for bringing this discussion up. Well, before we move on, Carolyn, can I just ask you a question? Um, do you think you benefited from the process of regression? Yes, it made me, it make it gave me a reason as to why I was dealing with these issues. Certainly, because I couldn't understand, all my friends weren't restless, why was I so restless? So it gave me a reason, it doesn't, it, it slightly helped that problem. Um, and another, another, another level was loneliness, and it turned out I was a very autocratic physician in Victorian England, and, and my, I, my family had left me because I was so full of myself. So it, it's, it's really interesting. I think sometimes the problem is people want to regress and be you know, Queen Victoria. Well, there was only one Queen Victoria. <laughs> but, but no, I do think, I do think if, if the way I was handled with this lady, it was, it was pertinent. Thank you. Thank and you. helpful. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Alf? Yeah, I'm going to uh, ask Paul to unmute and to speak. There you go, Paul. Thank you, Brother Presiding, Mr. President. Uh, I firstly agree with Charles, who said that uh, he uh, believes in reincarnation as fact. I do too, from the books about the Leinegger family and other people I've read about. I, I do think it's, it's fact. Um, and I, but I don't think, like Charles, that it should be mainstream spiritualism. I think we should be allowed to make our own minds of Brian. So Brian has said about hypnosis delving into the recesses of the mind and being able to bring out memories. Now that's been proven by the Bloxham tapes. Arnold Bloxham, one famous hypnotist from one of the founders of the movement into past life regression. He had a subject, a lady who lived in Lanishan, Cardiff, and he did six previous lives with her. One of the one, one of the lives 
was as a Jew escaping persecution in medieval York, mm. where the the life gave details about a crypt underneath a named church. And coincidentally, they dug up near the church and found a hidden crypt. So that seemed to validate the proof that uh, reincarnation was fact. But then another one of her lives was as a housekeeper in a Romano-British villa, waiting the arrival of the Roman emperor. And years later, a researcher just didn't believe that this hypnotic regression was proof of past lives. And he was scanning a book in a second-hand bookshop. He opened the book and he found, word for word almost, the transcript of that particular Bloxham tape about the visit of the Emperor Hadrian. But that was from a novel written 12 years before the woman was born. So the suggestion was she read it as a child and somehow the hypnotism accessed that, that memory verbatim. Now, maybe hypnotism is a proof. Certainly the people like the Leininger family and others I've read about, it, they seem so convincing that they they are the person who previously lived in physical flesh on the earth plane. But my question to Brian is, could the information have come from a spirit person by way of overshadowing or such beautiful mediumship, such natural mediumship of the child that they be became the person whose message they were delivering? Yeah, um, very interesting, Paul. First and foremost, yes, it can be through mediumship. Very, very unlikely, but it can be. We can't discount it. You mentioned the blocks and tapes. Um, <clears throat> York isn't that far from me here. Um, I'm in Scarborough, 45 miles from York, and I go to York quite often. I visit York quite regularly. I'm quite well aware of the church that was mentioned by Arnold Blocks. And I did see the program on the telly in the 1970s, um, and I've got a copy of his book. That church exists. It's on Castlegate in York. Uh, if you came out of the church down a slope, you'd be at the Viking Centre, and opposite you would be Marks and Spencers, and on the right would be Phoenix. Um, it was when they were building Phoenix that they found the crypt and it was full of charred remains. Uh, nobody knew why. Uh, nobody knew why the charred remains were there. And they, the story about the Jews came out afterwards. But when they discovered this crypt and they examined it and explored it, they started to get things out. They realized that the church, which is in Castlegate, which is approximately 100 yards from where the crypt was, um, had been rebuilt. It wasn't original build. And when they examined the rebuild, they realized that the stone from the rebuild came from the original church, which is where the crypt was. And it had been destroyed by fire. All that had come out from this lady um, and as you say, she lived in Wales. She had nothing whatsoever to do with York. She wasn't to know that York is one of the few cities in the world, I would think, that doesn't have many Jews. Even today, there are not many Jews in York. To the best of my knowledge, there isn't a synagogue in York. Um, the area where Phoenix was has always been peculiar to, to the people who live around it and, and work around it. It's always been a peculiar area. Um, and not far from there, in fact, about 200 yards from Phoenix, which is the site of the original church, church you've got um, the mound and the castle, which is a lot, um, opposite the castle museum. And uh, this tower, Clifford's Tower there, is a, a, a keep on a mound quite high it's about 40 50 feet high it's quite a lot of steps to get up there to, to go inside and have a look which you can do uh, and at the bottom of the staircase now there is the plaque which tells the story 
of the persecution of the Jews in York. And it's a story that's been developed, not necessarily as a result of the blocks and tapes, but as a result of inquiries made about this Jewish lady. Um, so there is a lot of evidence uh, to prove in that sense. There's a lot of evidence uh, that we can bring out in favour of accepting reincarnation. Um, I'm always cherry about accepting it as proof when I wasn't there. I wasn't there. I, I didn't witness those things. I have to accept on a record, if you like, that this, ha this happened. And if you want to verify the validity of the blocks and tapes, uh, he told another story about a gentleman um, who said he'd been with Nelson at Trafalgar and he'd been killed at Trafalgar by a piece of wood. And Arnold Loxham didn't really believe him. He thought it were a bit daft. How could a piece of wood kill you? Well, this gentleman was a gunner. And when the gunners uh, had fired the cannons, the enemy fired back. And any cannonballs that struck the side of the ship invariably split off splinters, which went all over the gun deck, piercing through legs and arms and bodies and what have you. And this chap, uh, one of the splinters, a quite a large splinter, had come through his leg. He had just about severed it and he bled to death. And that, you might say, is, is um, that's that, you know, you can't really do much about it. But um, in London, the Navy have records of all the naval ships and all the personnel that have been in the Navy going back to James I. And this man's name was on it. It showed him to be a gunner at the Battle of Trafalgar. And it showed him to have been killed when a splinter from the side of the ship removed his right leg and he bled to death. So the validity of the blocks and tapes, the, the book and the, and the tapes and what have you, can't really be called into question. And there are lots and lots, of, I think six, six that he took on the television, I don't know, there's seven or eight in the book. Um, they actually give a, 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 an account of about 20 years of Arnold Blocks and life. That's how long it takes to prove things like this. Um, but they do give an insight into the fact that memories can be acquired. They can be, um, mm. but not all of them. Some of them are based on fact. And if you, if you regress somebody and it takes an hour a day for seven days or 14 days or 21 days, you spend all that time, you might get one fact that they didn't know. One fact that they haven't read, can't possibly have known. One fact, and that fact is the one that you've got to re regard and look at and examine and make sure that what you're looking at is one of these facets from the diamond. But thank you for your question. Actually, the answer, yeah, very good. Cheers. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for asking that question. Really useful for us to know. I'm going to invite uh, Ricky to switch on your microphone now. Let me find you, Ricky. There you are. And thanks to Paul and welcome to Ricky. Thank you very much for this incredible, intriguing um, discussion. Go ahead. I'm uh, a clinical hypnotherapist as well has have gone through um, past life regression through a period of a year when I was doing my clinical hypnotherapy school. So the teacher um, in a private session hypnotizing me every session and I went, went into past life, uh, which was incredibly uh, helpful for my current life. Uh, I was born in Israel Jewish. All of my past life had nothing to do with Jewish or any places that I have had anything in red or memory uh, with that. So that might help with Paul answer because I had no idea, no knowledge of any of the past life I landed in. But my question is, I have two questions. I have a million questions, but I'm going to put two. <laughs> one for, <laughs> so one of them is, I've never thought about that past life equal reincarnation. But as you're speaking, it's completely making sense. So am I correct to say, 
uh, to infer that, uh, Brian, what you're saying that past life equal reincarnation, because if I'm in this life and I'm experiencing a memories of past life, that's mean I have lived that life and now I'm here. I, is that what you're saying? Not really. Okay. It, it's, it's quite complex to understand that we, we if, if you say to us, as, as a hypnotherapist, if you're going to do past life regression with someone, uh, in the demonstration, I usually say, can you put your hand up if you haven't read a book, if you've never watched a film, put your hand up if you've never read a newspaper, because all these things feed facts into your yeah, mind. Yeah, that was good, Thomas. That's right. Exactly. So, good so answer about the box we, we gather facts. Yeah. When we go into hypnotic regression, hypnotic regression just is a tool that we use to unlock memories, memories that are stored there. They can be stored there for a number of reasons. Uh, one uh, example that I have is someone that was hypnotized and regressed several times over quite a long period of time. And each regression, each time they went back, came uh, as a character who was lacking in self-confidence, who was always being downtrodden, always put down. And when uh, we discussed what had been going off, it, it was apparent that that was what was happening in this life, that what she had actually expressed was what she was suffering. And she made her mind up there and then to change it, and did. So, so it wasn't reincarnation so much as rebirth. She, she was born again in her own body, through her own mind, by finding the problem and eliminating it. But it can mean reincarnation if we've got the facts, if we can prove the facts and, and prove that they didn't know that if it was impossible to know. Uh, like you said, you know, you know nothing about Judaism in, in some of these lives. And you probably uh, expressed um, a little bit of fear or doubt, depending on how far back you went. Jews were not always liked as people. They've always been oppressed. Um, so we look at all sorts of things like that before we make the judgment. Uh, I'm a bit of, um, I don't know, uh, Job's comfort, I, I suppose, when it, when it comes down to it. I, I don't disbelieve, but I like to think that I don't just believe everything. I like to prove what I'm listening to and, and, and prove the, the veracity of the statements that I'm making um, because it's so easy to be fooled by someone. I, I've, I've been fooled myself quite a few times by people who have uh, wanted to believe something and wanted to be something and they're not. They weren't and they're never going to be. So yeah. I'm sorry if it doesn't answer your question. Um, no, it does. It does. That, that, that's, that's interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. My other good. question I have, if it's okay, is why, uh, and, and, and looked it up, and uh, there are many documents out there uh, about children who come in and remember mm -hmm. their life and tell mom or dad, and then mom and dad, and there is an investigator, I forgot his name, that takes them to that places. Yeah. So why, why would some remember and some don't? I think I'm going to uh, move over to Charles to uh, give uh, us a perspective on that, please. Charles. <laughs> well, you've touched on something which I think is something which we could put forward as very convincing evidence uh, for, the, for uh, previous lives. Uh, the one thing I put my faith in above most other things is the fact that children come out with these memories. Uh, like for instance, uh, a, a child who in his life saw elevator doors closing for the first time ever. I'd never seen that before, elevator doors closing. And he refused to go forward, uh, you know, because he was frightened of it. And his mother said that, you're okay, don't worry, it won't kill you. And he said it did before. Yeah. And there are so many cases here where children have recognized someone that they knew in a previous life and they're able to give details and so on. Uh, so I think that is a, a very, uh, a very, 
an area which we could uh, well do with uh, concentrating on because children uh, do not grow up with the prejudices of the adults. It's easy to pick, a, to pick apart uh, an adult's reaction and talk about um, the adult is affected by um, ancestral memory or spirit possession or he has created a subpersonality by his mind or is just fantasizing. But you can't put those uh, sort of reasons forward, usually in the case of children. So I think that is a very fruitful area we should concentrate on. But I would like to make one further point, and that is that although a lot of these reasons do make it difficult to use hypnotic regression, I mean, I've mentioned things like um, ancestral memory, telepathy, uh, the theory that we all have a collective unconscious that we can tap into, so we can be reaching out and tapping memories which have no connection with any of our previous lives whatsoever. All these things uh, make it difficult to use those as really strong arguments. But for me, the one thing that does make a very strong case in hypnotic regression is the fact that these hypnotherapists often use these to cure people's traumas and phobias. Yeah. One hypnotherapist said, if I can eliminate someone's phobia instantly and permanently uh, by making him or her remember an event from the past, then it, it seems to make logical sense that that happened to that person. And another one said, why should somebody else get released from a trauma by tapping into an event in somebody else's life? No. It doesn't make sense. No. So I think uh, that, I mean, it's it, regression is now, as Brian knows, it's used routinely to call, treat various problems and so on. And uh, I haven't seen this in action myself, but I'm told that when you see these patients going through the, the most intense emotions, um, sweating and flinching, as though they're reliving the exact events. Uh, I mean, one person said, if they're putting on an act, then they should be given an Oscar. Uh, and it, so for me, that uh, that is a clincher. Mm. The one thing I can say about the hypnotic regression is that uh, no matter what else you may say about it, I don't see how you can release traumas and phobias unless you are tapping into the life of the person who has been relieved of that phobia or trauma. So I think that's a very good clincher as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricky, for asking uh, that question. I, and equally to, to Charles. Can I agree with you? Can I have something else? Just briefly, um, for Ricky, uh, Professor Ian Stevenson, who is an American scientist, and I think he's a doctor, a medical doctor, um, has done a lot of research over many, many years into the memories passed from one child to another. Um, so that when uh, a child comes out with a statement, as Charles has just said, um, quite often that, that statement is true. It can't not be true. Um, he's done a lot of research into that sort of thing. Um, uh, one of the gentlemen that I used as a subject had twin girls, had two girls, two daughters, uh, who were killed in a car accident uh, in the northeast of England. He moved to Scarborough, his wife was pregnant again, and she had twin girls. And as those girls grew up, I knew them when they were in the 20s. Uh, and Ian Stevenson was still visiting them. He was still investigating them. He was still asking them questions. He was still talking about the things that they had said. They both picked out toys that the two previous girls had had, had and were favourite toys. It, they picked out lots of things. So the, the truth is there, but Ian Stevenson, he's written books. If you want to read about it, uh, Dr. Professor Ian Stevenson, um, easy chap. Thank you.
Thanks, Brian. Useful point there for us all. I'm going to go over to Helena now, and then we're going to go to Vanessa, who uh, has indicated she's got a question as well. So would you like to ask your question, Helena? Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I might put a spin on things, if you don't mind. It's, it's, I might sound a bit wacky, but I'll say it as it is. Um, if if you consider what I said in the last time in regards to um, the grain of salt, uh, not grain of salt, grain of sand, if we were to consider that a grain of sand is actually a part of three particles, and I guess three is in a lot of things true life. Now, if we consider the aspects, say, in regards to your reincarnation, your spirit and so forth, that we have a physical body, we have a natural body, and we've got a casual body. Now, if we consider the astral body as the spirit aspect, the casual side, which casual body you could say is what the collective mind, the consciousness that remains in spirit. The astral body is the one that travels between passing messages and obviously you've got your physical body. Now, as we know that, you know, when we pass, that cord is split. So the spirit goes back. Who's to say, just theoretically, that one consciousness is already, will always remain in spirit, hence why, you know, they say, you know, where people question, well, how can my loved one be here, but yes, be there. Usually the standard practice is if someone is to come back, it's about a thousand year practice that none of their family is alive because obviously it would, it would destroy the structure of everything. And in regards to, that's how I see it, it's split of three that, you know, obviously when your astral body, like when we sleep, we leave in our astral body, we talk to the spirit world. You know, it just makes sense that there has to be something above at the top as the casual body, which is consciousness. The same thing if you look at the pyramids, they have the same aspects where you could say you, you got your 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 what, queen's chamber. I consider that the consciousness. Um, and then obviously you've got your um, king's chamber, you know, the subconscious. And then you've got your unconscious, which is the one we can't tap into, which would be considered what well, your past life, spirit world. Um, that's just what I would say. There's a lot of aspects in regards to how you could look at it, which would actually make, for me, it makes common sense in simple terms. I just think we just make things complicated for ourselves. And in regards to the prisms, there's two prisms from different houses. So they mix, they, as I said, one life is gathered they come back when their new life has giving directions and what they want in this life. I mean, everyone has a right, what they want to learn. So obviously you say, you got a list, say, I want to experience this X, Y, and Z. So people say, well, we'll help you. Your spirit guides, your collective energy around you. They will guide you to help in this. Why a lot of people get deja vu. They're reliving the experiences that may be shared with the collective group of being there so they can actually learn the patterns of what they need to learn as a group. And then, as I say, there's an exchange, there's a crossover. There's always a crossover in regards to learning. As I say, you got your yin and your yang. And as I say, we all can live together and it's a part of the exchange, but I know it sounds a bit wacky, but that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. Uh, I'm going to uh, invite Vanessa now to uh, switch on your mic. Go, switch on your mic and ask you a question. Go for it. Hello. Um, a few years ago, I've never been regressed, but I had, as just as I was going off to sleep, I had this vision of me on a, a ducking stool. And as I was going underneath, I could see the murky river. And as I came up, I could see a bridge with all people looking. Um, and I sort of believe that that could have been a previous life. Um, but when I was a child, um, if my mum took me underneath a bridge, I used to scream. And I just wondered, you know, whether that was a previous life or not, you know? And um, do you have to be regressed all the time? Can you have previous lives through dreams? Okay. Thank you. So a good question for our panel, how do we validate these things to decide whether they are past lives or, or something yeah. different? Let's ask Charles and then Brian. Charles. The honest answer is that uh, you, 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 
you can't tell from individual cases whether they are or not. Um, each person's <coughs> feeling about it is, uh, is what has to be respected. If you don't feel it was a past life, and if you haven't been given evidence through the hypnotic regression that convinces you that that ducking stool had some memory, which you could uh, research and find out about. If you haven't got that backup evidence to support why that should uh, be given to you, then I can understand that you might feel that it's not given you any proof of the, you know, of, of a previous life. But in this life, I've got a fear of, I have asthma and I've got a fear of being suffocated. Uh, is that linked to the ducking stool then? Yeah, I could see myself going under. I could see the murky water. And as I came up, I saw a bridge with people looking over. Mm. And uh, you have a phobia. Sorry if I'm using the wrong word, but it gives you a sort of phobia about... Yeah, water. yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a very good swimmer, but I've got, a pho I've got asthma and I've got a phobia of being enclosed. Being yeah, suffered. right. That's quite common. Claustrophobia, that's yeah. right. And cats, I like cats. <laughs> uh, I mean, these sort of phobias certainly are the, the meat and drink for hypnotherapists. Uh, many of them, uh, you know, build their practice upon their ability to tap into uh, people's memories of past lives in order to find some source for that particular phobia in another life. Um, so there may well be something in a, a previous life you had which has given rise to this. Mm. And, and I think it's important to stress something I said earlier in this session. Although each incarnation is of a separate fragment, our guides do tell us that when you, when that incarnation is over, your experiences do go to the collective total self, which means that they can carry over to another incarnation of the same spirit energy system. So I think basically what I'm saying is um, it's very possible that something of has happened to you in a previous life, even though you are no longer the person who suffered that in that other incarnation, those memories can be transferred to you through some link where the higher self feels that you have to have that carried over for a spiritual purpose in, uh, in the next incarnation that comes through. Possibly there is a reason why that has been carried over and brought into your present life. Yes, thank you. It, it's either that or something has happened in your very early life, like in this incarnation. But I want to leave you with the possibility that it, it has so, indeed it was come so from true. another life. It Say was again. So thank you. Thank you. No. Thank you. And, and, and very quickly, we've got a little bit of time left. And your quick comments, please, Brian, about how yeah. do we um, validate these things? Yeah, the, the, the young lady is quite correct. Um, you don't need to be hypnotized to remember things. Um, people do have spontaneous memory. Um, and not just false memories, but spontaneous memories. I remember things that have happened in a previous existence or at a different time. Um, there is a technique, a lady wrote a book called The Christos Technique, um, where she described where you did all sorts of various things to somebody. You lay them on the floor and you massage their forehead and you massage their ankles and you talk to them and you sing to them. You do all sorts of things. And during that time, it releases the memories that they can come out with. And, um, I, I looked at it. I read the book and I was interested in it, but I thought, I'm not doing that. that that's a bit daft. It's, it's, it's getting a bit beyond a joke, is that? Um, so I devised a method where you can just talk to someone, sit them on a chair, talk to them, take them through a series of exercises, and in effect, release the memories from the brain um, so that they, the memories are given. They're not hypnotized. They're not asleep. They're not in a trance at, at all. Uh, you can get them to open their eyes and look around. You can get them to talk to the friends in the middle of it all and go straight back to where they were. Um, and then bring them back. And they come back with the memories, just as though they've been hypnotized and gone through a whole regression. 
Um, it's quite an interesting technique and it does work. Um, I would think it's more likely to work than regression on some people because uh, some people don't like the idea of being made to go to sleep. They, they, they want to be in control. In, in charge. So yes, you can remember things, uh, but also as Charles has said, if you've got a condition, um, it could be that you're remembering what happened in the past existence and that's what's causing the condition or bringing the condition on or making it worse. And I say it could be. It doesn't have to be. And it's not nailed down. It, it could be. Uh, so it's something that you need to examine, think about, and, uh, and just look at what, what's happening to you. Great ad advice there, Brian. Thank you for that. Thank you all for your questions. I'm going to hand back to David now for his closing remarks. Well, I'd like to thank both of our panel members, Charles and Brian, for bringing their knowledge of this particular subject. Um, I don't think we've, we've reached any uh, solid conclusions, but I don't think we really expected to. So um, thank you, gentlemen. It's been a great pleasure to have you as our guest this evening. And we've, we did say that we would overrun and allow the discussion to go on. And I'm sure it could go on further, but never mind. Um, tonight is our final session in audience with the president. Uh, I'd like at this point to thank all of my guests stretching back over the last 12 months. We've had a very eclectic uh, collection of people uh, within and without the movement. And I, I must admit, we've enjoyed everybody's contribution, which I'm sure has helped a lot of people over the months. Can I just say to you that we do plan to come back to audience with the president later in the year, but I hope this time it will not be because of a fourth lockdown. I am, my fingers are well and truly crossed that uh, we will be able to bring things back and, and meet and continue with the discussions. Spiritualism is a broad subject and we have so many people within our movement that have got great and wonderful experiences and it's always a pleasure to have that discussion. And I think it is important because it adds to our understanding of spiritualism. So I'd like to thank all of the people that have joined us over the last 12 months uh, as our audience and particularly the people like Brian that have made it virtually every week. There are a few people that have been here every week and thank you uh, for what you've brought and for your attention and for your interest. A big thank you to Alv who has been my long-suffering chairman keeping me going and keeping the technology working. I thought at one stage tonight we were, we were going to lose it with uh, a rather bad internet connection, but it all seems to have been resolved. So for the third series of Audience with the President, I thank everybody. I wish you well. I hope that you keep safe. And as the lockdown is lifted, that we can come back to some kind of normality. And what's most important to open our churches again and to begin to worship physically together again. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your input. Thank you for everything that you've brought that has made a concept that was thought very quickly last March, audience with the president, to be a resounding success that I've enjoyed every minute. I know Alva's enjoyed it and uh, thank you for all that has made it possible. So I'm going to hand back to Alv. Good night, God bless, and take care. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Charles, for another great evening. As always, you can catch up with what's happening around the Union by following our social media channels. On Facebook, it's the Spiritualist National Union, and on Instagram and Twitter, it's at Spiritualist SNU. We have a YouTube channel at SNU Film, and you can see many of the audience with the president shows which, which are on a playlist there. In particular, if you've been interested in this evening session, you'll want to watch the first session around reincarnation that we held last year. Thanks everyone for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you for series four. We'll let you know when that is. Just keep following our social media and you'll find out. God bless everyone and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.